64K. Where the future is so bright you gotta wear shades. Hey, Bastish B here for 64K and welcome to another episode of One Man and His Machine. And today's profile is about Kenji Ino, a Japanese game designer and musician. These were his machines of choice. Let's check out the early years. Kenji Ino was born in 1970 in Arakawa, Tokyo, Japan, and he was a pretty gung-ho video game designer and musician. His games were kinda unorthodox and didn't fit neatly in with anything else. For English fans, he's probably best remembered as helping pioneer this survival horror genre of games, where he created some really interesting and unique titles. He was also a musician and produced soundtracks for many of his own games and for other people, starting on the Famicom all the way up to the Dreamcast and beyond. He was a well-known electronic musician in Japan and released several albums, as well as founded multiple video game companies. The most well known of his was Warp. But before we start looking at everything in detail, let's jump back to the beginning. Even as a kid, Kenji loved video games. He was reclusive and video games brought him comfort. He spent a lot of time at the local arcades as well and cited Space Invaders and Pac-Man as being the games that made him want to join the industry. He created his first game, Toadoko Murder Case, and entered it in a local video game competition. It didn't place first, but was received favorably. He then dropped out of high school and decided that gaming was what he wanted to do. His first real industry job was for a Japanese company called Interlink. They were not well known outside of Japan and made the 1989 strategy game Moulin Rouge War Chronicle and many more obscure Famicom games. Kenji was hired based on his game Toadoko Murder Case, but he had no real programming skill, at least with modern software or computers. He almost got fired immediately until he told him he was a musician as well, and he ended up working in their sound department, where he headed up design as well as sound, but ultimately was unsatisfied working there because he wanted more control over the games he was making and eventually left in 1989 to form its first company, EIM Limited, with the idea to have complete creative freedom on the games he was making. He saw an opportunity in the industry to focus the company on making sequels or spin-offs to popular games so that the big companies could continue on and make new RPs. EIM ended up being pretty successful, but inadvertently he had made himself a slave once again to his clients' wishes and was forced to follow their ideas for the most part. A lot of Famicom and NES games were produced during this short lifespan where Kenji contributed to design and music like Time Zone, Casino Kid 2, and most notably to Western audiences was Panic Restaurant on the NES, which has become really sought after and expensive. With his disillusion over the industry growing daily, he decided to shut down EIM in 1992 and change careers and worked as a consultant in the automotive industry for the next two years. But his passion for gaming was reignited when he attended Macworld 94 convention and a couple of others that year and was amazed at the advancements in CD-ROM technology could bring to games. He decided to form a new company called Warp and was particularly enamored with Panasonic's 3DO system. He formed a small but very talented team made up of, amongst others, Fumito Ueda, who later worked on Eco and Shadow of the Colossus on the PS2, Takeshi Nozoe, who ended up working on Final Fantasy VII Advent Children and a Chiro Itano of Macross fame. Starting in 1994, they produced a lot of weird and unorthodox games for the Japanese 3DO market, including Short War and Oyaji Hunter Mayong. But the big success was a game called D, released on the 3DO and Sega Saturn in 1995. It was a huge hit on both systems and helped calm Kenji's mental health, which was all over the place at the time. He had also just gotten married during the creation of D, and the 3DO had basically been deemed a failure as a system and was discontinued. Fortunately, D was the saving grace and the Sega Saturn in Japan was hugely successful and D became an instant cult classic and financial success. And we'll be looking at all these major games in more detail in the game section later on in the video. He then signed a contract with Sony to port D to the PS1. 100,000 pre-orders were agreed upon for production, but Sony apparently only printed 40,000 and left many people without a way to get the game. Sony placed other games higher on their production list, even though a deal had been made. Kenji later found out that the real print run was even lower, with less than 28,000 produced, and was furious, especially considering they were a small company with a massive hit game. Every unit was really important to him. He felt betrayed 
and in 1996 he signed a multi-game deal with Sony's direct rival Sega and publicly denounced Sony at a Japanese press conference by revealing his new game was going to be a Sega Saturn exclusive by morphing the PlayStation logo into the Saturn one during the presentation. Sony was humiliated and all ties with them were severed. In 1996 saw the release of Enemy Zero on the Saturn, another game similar to D but with an added first person survival aspect. Again, a really unique and original game that wasn't as successful financially as D, but it's a damn good game nevertheless. In 1997 we saw his strangest game released called Real Sound on the Saturn. It was also ported to the Dreamcast in 1999. It was a game made for blind gamers. Kenji apparently received many letters from blind gaming fans claiming to love his games due to the rich soundscape they all had and therefore without visuals they could still follow most of his games. Kenji was pretty moved by this and decided one of his games in his Sega contract was going to be for the blind and asked Sega to donate 1000 satins with the game to blind gamers. They agreed and yet another unique game from Kenji was born. It was a visual novel style game where you could play the whole game without ever looking at the screen. The sound told the story. The following year in 1998 he did the soundtrack to the Dreamcast racing game Sega Rally 2 and worked closely with Yu Suzuki who he later said was really helpful to him in the making of his final big game, D2, the sequel to the original D that was made for the Dreamcast in 1999. Although Laura the character also appeared in Enemy Zero, this was considered the true sequel to D. It took the form of an excellent third person action adventure game with strong story elements and some of the D style first person exploration and was a really fantastic entry in the survival horror genre. Despite the top quality of all these games, the sales were a bit sluggish in the west and Kenji decided to close down Warp in 2000. Okay, so this is usually the part of the show where I run through every single game that a person made. But I've specifically mentioned all his earlier stuff in the little insert you saw earlier. I did that on purpose because I really want to focus on three games. These are three games that I think are really excellent and unique and strangely bizarre in some sort of reason that only Kenji Ino could have brought to the table. So let's check out these three gems. D was released in 1995 on the 3DO and a few months later on the Sega Saturn and can be best described as a horror interactive movie. The game was in development for a year and all the graphic FMV sequences were made using Amiga 4000 computers. Kenji said in an interview that D would not exist if it wasn't for the text adventure series Transylvania that was released in 1984 on the Apple II. Commodore 64, DOS and various other computers. He said the pacing, story and atmosphere was the building block for D. The story for the game involves a character named Laura who appears in all three of the D trilogy of games we're going to look at here although each game is its own self-contained experience. She finds out that her father has murdered a whole bunch of people and barricaded himself in an old hospital. She goes to try to find out what happened, but when she enters the hospital it transforms into a gothic castle and she's stuck in there with no choice but to continue further with the hope of finding him. Explaining any more of the story is definitely a spoiler, but rest assured, by the end it's a pretty bizarre and fascinating conclusion. You move around through FMV sequences and interact with objects and puzzles, all the while finding out more about your father and your own past. The game's not massive and you have a 2 hour time limit. There's also multiple endings depending on some crucial choices at the end, as well as there's no save option. It's do or die. Kenji was afraid the game was going to get censored when he submitted it to the ratings board, so he actually gave them a version of the game with all the disturbing stuff cut out. They approved the game, and Kenji then delivered the uncensored version to the manufacturers for production. Hence the reason we have this game in all its creepy glory. The game was a massive hit in Japan, selling over a million copies on the Saturn, and was the most successful game the 3DO ever had. So much so that it got a re-release director's cut called D's Diner, which had a few extra scenes and a soundtrack CD. Overall I love this game's look and feel, the slow creepy pace with excellent use of subtle music and sound effects. The game's not too long and the puzzles are just the right degree of challenging. It's well worth checking it out as an early example, at least atmosphere wise, of the survival horror genre. If you're unable to get hold of a PS1 3DO or Saturn version to play, then the MS-DOS version was re-released and is available on Steam and GOG. And next is 1996 
Sega Saturn gem, Enemy Zero, which was also released on Windows in 1998. The game had a pretty quick 9 month development cycle, and this time silicone graphics workstations were used for the FMV visuals. The English version also sports Laura's voice being done by Jill Cuniff of the 90s rock band Luscious Jackson, and the soundtrack this time was done by Michael Nyman, the award winning composer of the movie The Piano and the super underrated sci-fi classic Gattaca. Kenji was a massive fan of his compositions and on a visit to Japan, which Nyman was donating pianos after the 1995 earthquake in Kobe, Kenji was able to get a meeting with him and managed to convince him to do the soundtrack for the game. He has Kenji's own words on the encounter. When I found out he was in Japan, I invited him back to my hotel room and tried to convince him for 6 hours to come work with me. So at the end, Michael was like, okay, okay, I'll do it. Just let me go back to my room. So he went back exhausted of after being convinced for 6 hours. We didn't work out terms or conditions, he just said he would do it. Plot wise it's got elements from the Aliens movies where Laura wakes up after having her hypersleep disrupted to find out that the ship is infested with aliens. So she tries to go find out what's going on, all the while trying to find the escape pod to leave the ship. It features two different gameplay styles. The first is the FMV investigation stuff where all the plot and puzzles are solved. And the second is a first person mechanic where running or defending yourself from the aliens is imperative. Did I mention that the aliens are invisible? No? Well, yeah, they are. <laughs> so you have to rely on sound to figure out where they are and when to shoot. This is one of the most coolest and stressful things I've ever experienced in a game and it works brilliantly and pumps up the survival horror aspect tenfold. The game's way bigger than D and has save points. The investigation aspect is very cool with excellent use of FMV and atmosphere building. The music and sound effects are haunting and the sound effects are particularly important to gameplay. Many of the characters you meet here are also in D2 even though like I said earlier they are unconnected story wise. The game again was extremely popular in Japan but didn't do that well in the rest of the world due to the Saturn's already dwindling popularity in those regions which is a real shame. Not only did Japan get the full Michael Nauman soundtrack but also the only 20 copies of the special edition were made costing roughly $2000 each each, with the bonus of Kenji himself and delivering the copy to you personally. And now onto the final game I wanted to highlight, and the last in the official D trilogy called D2, which was released in 1999 on the Sega Dreamcast, and was the last game made in Kenji's multi Sega game contract, and Warp's last game. It was originally being developed for Panasonic's M2 console, the follow up to the 3DO, but the console was eventually cancelled, and the whole production moved over to Sega's new Dreamcast, and turned out for me at least to be one of my top 10 favourite games on that system. The plot this time definitely has threads of John Carpenter's The Thing and has you again as Laura whose plane is getting taken over by terrorists as a meteorite hits the plane sending it crashing into the frozen Canadian wilderness. Not only is it a game of survival horror with many of the passengers being mutated by the meteor but it's also a survival game with hunting for food being a necessity to surviving. But it's also got the aspect of exploration just like the previous games which takes place once you enter buildings or locations. The action also takes place in these RPG style encounters where you earn experience for killing monsters which upgrades your health. This game is just cool on so many levels. Kenji's awesome music score the frantic but extremely satisfying combat sequences, the puzzle solving aspect, the excellent hunting mechanic and the crazy awesome story that has you glued to your seat wondering what's going to happen next. If you ever manage to get to the end boss then Enemy Zero fans can attest to probably one of the most unique boss fights I've ever encountered. A friend once described this game to me as an indie movie made into a game and it's pretty accurate. It's strange and offbeat and is an excellent addition to the survival horror genre which has some really excellent graphics, sound and game design. The game garnered mostly positive reviews in Japan and worldwide with Japan receiving 4 different cover version releases. The game is only available on the Dreamcast with the English version being slightly censored in one of the opening scenes involving tentacles. This was another gem from Kenji and is my personal favourite of the D series and as a game as a Dreamcast fan you should definitely try it if you haven't already. So you're probably wondering what ever happened to Kenji Ino after 1999's D2. 
After the demise of Warp, Kenji opened Super Warp in the late 2000s but never actually produced any games and worked with the Japanese cell phone company Docomo on various applications and other marketing jobs. Super Warp was eventually disbanded in 2005. His real return to gaming would only come in late 2009 when he released the puzzle game You, Me and the Cubes on the Wii downloadable service WiiWare. It was received quite well and the game was very popular. He then moved on and made various cell phone games for the Japanese gaming market. Unfortunately, in February 20th, 2013, Kenji was found dead in his apartment. The cause of death was hypertension, which is a heart attack brought on by major stress. He was only 42 years old. Family and colleagues were shocked and we lost one of the most unique game designers and musicians of recent years. At least for Kenji, his games and music will always live on. <laughs> Okay, I hope you enjoyed that little profile on Kenji Ino. He was a really unique person and game designer. I hope it inspires you to go check out some of his older work. It's really good stuff. Thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. I hope you had a good time. And if you could like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.